Welcome, everyone. We are live with another episode of Level Up Law, where every Tuesday at noon here at South Carolina Legal Services, we are leveling up your legal knowledge about an area of law that we practice in. Um, but as well, we try to bring in some of our partner organizations that we work with, and they're doing such great work um, out there in the community. Um, and we are doing that today with uh, Jerry Blassingame, who is the founder and CEO of Soteria CDC. Um, as we are continuing our observance of Second Chances Month, we are delighted to have you with us, Jerry, uh, to talk about Soteria and how you guys are helping folks who are reentering society. So welcome. Well, Susan, thank you so much for having me, and I'm excited to spend uh, some time with you this morning. Well, thanks. Um, and uh, I'm Susan Ingalls, uh, Senior Staff Attorney here at South Carolina Legal Services. And as always, we do have Kenneth Elliott in the background, our producer who is making sure everything is working for us and it seems to be working today. So before we get started, I do want to remind everybody that none of what we'll talk about today is legal advice, of course. Um, it's just general information for the public, but it is great and important information that we're bringing you today. Um, if you do need the assistance of an attorney, uh, you can uh, apply for our services and that information will be provided for you in the description box uh, below in this video on YouTube when we post it. As we always say, um, we're live, but we know that there will be an audience on the replay on YouTube, so we make sure that um, you know that that's going to be posted and you have the information about how to contact us if you do need an attorney. And usually Kenneth um, uploads the video within about 24 hours to the YouTube channel, so uh, no need to furiously take notes or anything like that because you can always uh, watch it again. Um, while I uh, do have the attention of our audience, whether it's live or on the replay. I want to remind you to check out our social media. Um, we're on all the social media networks as at SC Legal Services. And we want you to check that out, especially on our YouTube channel. You can subscribe, you can turn on the notification bell so that you know every time we upload a video from Level Up Law episode or any of the other many videos and resources that we put out for our um, community here on South Carolina Legal Services. And again, we'll have all of that information in the description box below. So let's get right to it. That's enough about that. Um, Jerry, can you start by just telling us a little bit about the mission, you know, the vision of um, Soteria, how it's specifically um, aims to support uh, folks who have been incarcerated but are re-entering society through um, the initiatives that you guys have. Most oh. de definitely, Susan. So the first sentence of our mission statement is that we advocate for economic and social justice for those and their families who've been impacted by the criminal justice system. You know, we're helping things with housing, um, um, you know, life skills and things like that. And then with, within our vision statement, we talk about collaborating with the community, you know, other nonprofits, churches, businesses, and this was written over 25 years ago. So we want to make sure that men and women who are getting out of prison have all of the resources they need to become productive citizens, you know, from, from housing to employment, education, you know, getting back with their families, uh, even, you know, being uh, accepted into the community. You know, a lot of people get out and they don't feel like society has forgiven them. Um, and so our mission and vision, you know, helps individual to feel that. And every day, our staff, we work to make sure that people who are returning home uh, feel accepted and have the proper resources they need and that, um, you know, they can get out after they've served their time to be productive. Susan, I can't hear you. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Oh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> um, yeah, a little glitch there for me. Thank you, producer uh, Kenneth. Anyway, um, yeah, it's so wonderful what you guys do. And it's what I really um, love about the mission and the vision because you have those people who might not otherwise be able to um, get 
just really get going, I guess, once they um, come out. So I do have, I think I know the answer to this, but for our viewers, tell us kind of how you were inspired to um, get this started and, you know, what, you know, personal experience or values um, kind of drive your commitment to the Satari. Most definitely. I get this question all the time because people always ask, why are you working with people who are getting out of prison? Um, and you have to have experience, and that's actually my life experience. Um, in 1995, I was given a 20-year prison sentence for several drug charges. And um, it was my second time. The first time I spent four and a half months in prison for um, a simple possession of marijuana charge um, and also a uh, possession of cocaine charge. Um, but while I was in incarcerated, I met so many people who had been in and out of the system, which it was my second time. But I knew that I was going to be out one day. You know, I was thinking it was going to be 15 years at least, or you know, 12 years on the 20. But I knew that I was going to be out, and I wouldn't be, you know, an old man. I would be able to still have a family. And I was thinking about what I could do. So while I was there, I found out that people couldn't get housing when they got out, uh, em employment, a lot of things. And I know the first time I got out and came back home, I tried to go back to school. And I couldn't receive a Pell Grant because of my drug conviction. It was because of the crime bill that was out in, in the 90s. And so um, I served three and a half years in. And every day for three and a half years, I studied, I prayed, I researched on what I could do. So I wrote the vision for this organization while I was serving time in prison. My personal conviction in coming to faith and becoming a Christian also drives me and leads me because the whole time I was in prison, I refused to do what everybody else did in prison. <laughs> you know, there's so many things going on in prison that you can get in trouble. But I, I chose to study. I chose to pray. I researched. I, I even took college classes while I was in um, while I was incarcerated. And uh, by the time I was released in 1999, I only served three and a half years. I was paroled. I had about 250 handwritten pages of a vision. For this organization so i used my time wisely while i was incarcerated i was released in march of 1999 and in april of 1999 we had started an organization it was ready up and running had a few board members and i was excited about it and the only reason i was able to start so fast because i utilized the time while incarcerated to write a vision write down my goals write down all the things that i wanted to do when i got out but 25 years my faith has kept me grounded and this is the hardest thing i've ever done in my life <laughs> yeah well you know and what a great um you know i guess revealing that you spent that time so wisely when you were incarcerated because i'm sure there is a lot of time you know that you have and you know, people might do other things with that time, but you really used it um, for the good and look where everything is now. It's just, um, it's terrific. Um, what a great way to um, get this started and keep it going all these years. That's a great personal story that I really appreciate. We, you know, um, here at Legal Services, we um, help with expungements and pardons for people who have been justice involved and if it's, you know that we're in second chances month right we're trying to help people remove those barriers to um some of the things that they want to do when they um when they re-enter society and those criminal charges can be a real um, barrier and sometimes they maybe didn't even um go to jail for those uh charges or that conviction and but tell us um a little bit about that that barrier you know because that criminal record can really negatively affect things like just getting a job or um you know getting your driver's license back or any number of things how can that have a positive impact removing that well, that is that is another great question um i have per my personal experiences with barriers you know getting out um, as I mentioned, I had a 20 year sentence. I got released in only three and a half years. So I had 11 years parole when I returned. And the first 90 days of that parole was on monitoring, electronic monitoring. And so it was very limited what I can do and where I could go in the jobs that I could receive. And so 
after I started my organization, I went five years, started my organization. I got five years in, into doing a nonprofit. And then my parole agent told me that I couldn't run a nonprofit because I was doing housing and I was on parole and I was fraternizing with other parolees. And so they made me step down from my executive director role. And we got an attorney that worked with us pro bono, worked with me personally. And he said, Jerry, you know, after you complete five years on your sentence, you can apply for a pardon. And I didn't know that. Back then, you know, this type of, you know, like podcasts and the information wasn't out like it is now. And so uh, reluctantly, I applied for a pardon and ended up getting a pardon. And I was able to be established back into my role as a executive director. But one thing I realized that a a pardon did not expunge my charges. So I'm educating myself all at the same time. So I, I went one Christmas to get a part-time job at one of the big box stores to make some extra money. And I found out that uh, my record was still showing. I had a pardon, but my record still showed to anybody who researched my record. And so I found out quickly that I needed to get some of this stuff expunged off my record so that I can, um, you know, like housing and employment and some of the things that, you know, regular citizens, you know, were enjoying, I couldn't. So it was my own personal experience why we do uh, some of the pardons and expungements and why we encourage people to get their record pardoned and expunged. So I ended up getting, getting that, but it took me 13 years to help get an expungement bill passed for drug charges. Um, and so we found out that over the last 15 years, we've helped people get back into nursing or get housing and get better jobs by getting their records expunged um this this bill that was passed in 2018 it got all of the rest of the uh non-felony charges expunged and then first offense drug charges as you know were you know are able to get expunged now now people can get jobs and you know and not get barred because of their criminal record um, and, you know, we, we do want time to pass by, you know, people need to get out and get a job and get their credit and get established before they get their record expunged. But we do believe that that is the best way for um, for people to get acclimated and, uh, you know, get their rights restored by getting pardons and expungements. Um, right. and, yeah, I mean, so and it's a great. Law, that law was um, just such a game changer, I think, in so many ways. And it's really helping people. So I definitely applaud you for the work you know, that you did on that, because you're right, that getting that record expunged and where it doesn't show up when you apply for a job is really crucial. Now, not everybody can accomplish that. It, it all, I know it depends, but um, but it's a great law and it has really helped a lot of people. So um, I commend you for your efforts in getting yeah. that accomplished because I know it's something that, you know, that we work with all the time. So let's talk about, <clears throat> I'm sure you had some uh people that you collaborated with not only in that law but in you know what you do at Soteria on a day-to-day -day basis and I think we all know in, in you know our world certainly that collaboration and partnerships is so important you know I think it used to be that everybody was very competitive you know but now I think there's so much more uh collaboration between various organizations, the government, nonprofits, to accomplish what needs to be accomplished, you know, in our society. So, um, and I know y'all have great partnership and collaboration. Tell us a little bit about um, other organizations or, you know, stakeholders that you guys work with that really enhance your ability to um, have those great outcomes that you have. Most definitely. So, one of the one of the the first collaborations that I well, two of the first collaboration that I ever, you know, engaged in was a collaboration with the um, South Carolina Community Economic Development Corporation. That's why we became a CDC, a community development corporation, because there were so many resources that the CDC industry had because 20 something years ago, there was no funding or anything for reentry organizations. You know, back then, it was, it was called prison aftercare. So, so partnering with CDCs and Bernie Mazee was great because I was able to tap into the whole CDC economic engine. You know, you're talking about banks, uh, CDFIs, um, housing. So all those came into play. And then I met Michael Chesser of the Upstate Homeless Coalition. You know, he was the person who was doing the homeless 
for uh you know here in greenville and we got our first house our first transitional house through that organization and so uh, by the time i guess three or four years went by we had four houses through the upstate homeless coalition uh banks have been unlikely bedfellows with us you know um banks they partner with us to teach financial literacy they partner with us for funding some of the foundations for the banks uh give us money we partner with the city of greenville the county of greenville the state other nonprofits, churches have been a, a, a big part we get a lot of our mentors from churches uh we have a lot of people come and teach bible studies and life skill classes yeah. uh, financial literacy is huge in our organization because we want men and women to get out and, and uh, live on a budget and get their credit straightened out so that they can become homeowners and business owners. And we partner with a lot of financial institutions and banks uh, um, and financial planners with that as well. So we have a plethora of people from around the county and state that love what we do and probably the nation too. I've been invited to Capitol Hill a couple of times to do some things. And so I'm just thankful for all the collaborations. And that's part of our vision as well to link all of these different partners in the community you know, like the old African proverb, it takes a village. So it takes a village, takes all of us to come together to help those with criminal backgrounds. Yeah, and when you think about <clears throat> all those years ago when you this was all first germinating in your mind and you were, you know, making your plans, you know, who knew that you would be one of your, you know, your organization is a model for others. And, you know, um, I know, I'm sure that your, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, services as a speaker um, to talk about how you did it and how others can do it around the country. Um, I'm sure you get a lot of uh, a lot of calls for that. So again, we appreciate you being here with us today because I know you are a busy fellow, especially during Second Chances Month when you've got so many great um, activities going on and I'm sure with many of these um, partners. Yeah, we've been doing a lot for this month and um, Another partnership I want to just mention real quick is that every year we have a fundraiser in October and um, my director of development, Captain Blunt, is an artist and she's been able to bring some artists, local artists uh, from around the, the, the city to partner with us. So the last four years, artists have linked us up with us to donate their artwork uh, to do fundraisers for us. And who would have thought that the artists and people that are getting out of prison would be working together. But it's awesome to have that. I'm very thankful for the artists in Greenville as well. Yeah, and I think as you, you know, talk to different organizations and people in the community and they learn about what you guys are doing and how effective it is, I'm sure you get a lot of, yeah, I want to be involved in that uh, from people. Yeah, and so that's what. Yeah. Um, so I know your approach to um, the kind of community development and what you do for um, the folks that y'all are serving is, um, you know, is a holistic type of situation. Um, how do you prioritize all the different areas uh, that you have where you support uh, folks? I know it's you said jobs, you, you listed a, a number of things and you know, how does that affect not only um, the people who are reentering society and, and you know, getting stabilized, but also I think it's helpful to our community here in Greenville and beyond. Yeah, great. Another great question. So we have a five prong approach of housing, employment, education, advocacy and affirmation. And so every staff meeting I talk about the most important thing in all of those is our interns. We call the people in our program, our participants, interns. You know, we say you're doing a one year internship. And so and, and so we prioritize, you know, first of all, we got to provide for the people that we're helping. Everything that we do falls down to the individuals in our transitional housing program. So they are priority, loving them and making sure they have the things that they need. So mentoring, um, have, having a house, that they can live in, food, clothes, those are, you know, those things are necessity. Having good staff people is also, you know, we have to do that. But, you know, besides that, employment, making sure they work. And so we have a Soteri at work, which is our social enterprise that gives jobs to some of the men in our program. Uh, funding, we have to have funding. A third of our income is earned. And 
And so we also own 18 low income rentals. So you, like you say, we have a lot of things that we do and I'm trying to talk about prioritizing and sometimes it's hard <laughs> because we do so much. We have to, as a nonprofit, we have to be entrepreneurial, but, but we also have to make sure the people in the beds are getting what they need, but we also have to make sure our staff gets paid. So our earned income is a key thing that, you know, that we prioritize as well as the, the people in our program. Um, so the 18 low income rentals are paid for. So that's pure profit that comes in. It can go directly to operations. We also charge a fee after our interns get a, a, a job and that money is pure profit. It goes to our operations. We get some grant funding and then in individual funding. Most of our individual funding is um, not restricted as well. The grants, most of the grants are restricted. Um, and so mentoring is a big part of our program. And so we try to make sure that everybody coming to our program has a mentor. Uh, and I'm always looking for new and innovative thing. As you see, I'm an out of the box thinker. And so I may have a pro something I prioritize this week and next week my staff will say, Jerry, we just talked about this last week. Why are you changing it? So, but it's, <laughs> fun, it's all in fun and they know that I'll turn on a dime. And uh, one of the words around our office is you got to learn how to pivot and know how to pivot working with Jerry Blasting Game. Uh, you know, but we do have our our five pillars that we prioritize the things that we do, the housing, employment, you know, the education, the advocacy work, and of course, all of the life skills and things like that. So, yeah, there are so many things to be done and so many um, partners that you can work with, but also just the creating ideas, which you're so good at about how to accomplish what you guys are doing. And I think um, that's great. Tell me uh, a little bit more about Soteria at Work. Yeah, so, so most definitely. Soteria at Work is a social enterprise. Uh, it's about 10 years old, but prior to that, we had a social enterprise called Green Start, which was a pure recycling business. It was single string recycling. We had a five-year contract with the school district of Greenville County, single string recycling, paper, plastic, cardboard, and aluminum. So we, we had two box trucks we'd send around to the schools every day to collect all of the paper and, and uh, plastic and cans from the schools. And about six years into that, you know, recycling kind of stopped, you know, the city and county kind of had some problems. And um, Jenny Stroud from the city of Greenville back then uh, saw an article about um, tearing down houses and using recycled wood that they were doing it in a prison in Des Moines, Iowa. So I went out to the morning, I got trained, came back, got the guy who trained me to come and train five of our guys. And we started a deconstruction business where we would tear down old buildings and barns. And we had all this lumber in our storehouse and we didn't know what to do with it. And I built the farm table one day and somebody wanted to buy it. So that was the startup of the business. It wasn't even supposed to be a business. It was like, I need to get rid of some of this wood. But over the last 10 years, we've developed uh, this, uh, this hobby into a business where we can hire up to five of our men four to five of our men to work not only to tear down houses to salvage the wood but to reclaim that and turn it into beautiful furniture and so um, when Catherine Blunt came on staff she changed the name from Green Start to Soteri at Work so that we can have other businesses under that umbrella so it's a great business it's a great tool where men are learning the skill uh, that they can take to other jobs with them yeah, isn't that um, amazing how something like that just starts out with making that one table and then it, you know, blossomed into so much, uh, so much more. So um, let's talk about what the future holds for Soteria, just kind of looking ahead. Um, how do you envision continuing to make a difference? And you've kind of already said that. Um, you've talked about how there's all these ongoing, you know, ideas and ways to keep doing what you're doing and keep developing what you're um, developing. But what, what do you see as uh, the future? For well, the we talk about this a lot in our staff meetings. We're right now in the embassy stages of our next strategic plan. And, uh, you know, we're, our staff is growing. There are other places, not only in South Carolina, but in, in our nation that needs organizations like Soteria. So we're looking to scale our organization so that we can have other soterias around town or train other cities to do what we do and not having a name. Um, and also to, you know, to make a bigger impact in policy work. I think if we can get some of our policies changed, 
you know, I can work myself out of a job. You know, we need less prisons and we need more colleges. We need more education. You know, right now we're paying more money to incarcerate a person than it does for a college education, and that's not right. So I want to be responsible for helping to change that. Uh, you know, people have to go to prison. They need to get out with some type of skill uh, so that they can get out and get back to work. And so these are all the things that we talk about all the time. Um, and so I'm excited, um, you know, to see what the next few years uh, look like for us. Uh, and I'm, like you said, I'm always speaking and sharing my story and sharing the story of Satir. So hope, hopefully my story is inspiration to others that they'll go out and start something similar so I don't have to do all the work. Yeah. You know, I know that you uh, mentioned uh, Bernie Mazik uh, and South Carolina Association of uh, Community Economic Development. Shout out to them. What a wonderful um, organization. And I know I participated um, in their conference last year and you did the um, reentry simulation that you brought, which I think kind of is a, a great segue from what you were just saying, because you're educating people about basically what it's like and the struggles and the barriers when people get out of prison. Um, and I know you're getting ready to do it or you may have already done it um, uh, here at Furman maybe in Greenville. Tell us a little bit about that simulation because I think, um, I, I know our viewers would love to know about, you know, what the vision is on that and kind of how that works to educate people. Most definitely. We just completed one at, at Furman a few weeks ago and we have one this week, Susan, at, um, um, West Westminster uh, Presbyterian Church on Augusta Road at six o'clock. So it'll be this Thursday night. Um, but that okay. simulation, it actually simulates what is like uh, the first month that someone get out of prison. And, and in the simulation, we have like a 15 minute week. And so during that week, you have to get out and get your IDs. Uh, you have to find housing. You have certain things that you have to do. You have to report to a PO. You have to get food, you have to get clothes. Some some people may have a baby in that simulation. And so you gotta, and it just helps you to navigate all of this stuff without any resources, without anybody telling you what to do or where to go. And so it really gives a bird's eye view of what an individual goes through the first month when they get out of prison with nothing but the clothes on their back most of the time. Um, so, so it's an eye opener for most citizens who who, who don't understand. Yeah, I think it's uh, really great, and I really um, you know, definitely enjoyed that. I think um, several of us from legal services were there and did that, and you know, um, we did a uh, a TikTok video, right? Um, yes, about it that, that went viral. Yes, it was fun. And, yeah. yeah, people wanted so much to know more about it that uh, I know um, Sally, our marketing director, came over and did some more interviewing with you about you know, how that all works. So I thought that was also a, a great way to get get some positive stuff on TikTok, right? It was definitely, it was really good. And we've been getting calls from all over the nation asking us to bring uh, our reentry simulation. So we're trying to figure all that out as well. Yeah, and you know, we'll be sure and link, um, uh, put a link down in the description on YouTube to that um, in case any of our viewers uh, would like to, uh, to look at it. Well, um, We've got a little bit more time and I want to talk about um, just what's what would you say the impact of what you do has been on our community here in Greenville, just in, you know, in general, because I think it's been a very, very impactful. Yes, most definitely. Um, I am I'm, I'm, I am so blessed that Greenville supports what we do. We've been here for a while. Uh, we are one of the number one committing counties that we commit more people to the Department of Corrections than any other county. We've been in the top 10 for the last 15 years, probably. We're somewhere within the top five all the time. Um, in the last five years, our recidivism rate from Soteria has hovered anywhere from 94 to 96% success that people don't go back to prison. Uh, and so I know that is a great impact on our community where people are getting out and committing less crimes because they are getting a job, they're getting housing, they're budgeting their money, they're getting the credit, you know, they're getting their children's back. Um, and they are, you know, becoming part of a family and, and becoming part of a community. And we are involved in public safety. We don't talk about this a lot, but Soteria is actually public safety. And, and, and so I wanna be recognized as we are part of public safety as well. And so, 
that's why I believe so many people give to us and donate to us because they see the actual effect of what our organization does. And it gives hope. You know, one of our slogans is where hope for the future begins. And not only hope for the individuals that are coming through our program, but hope for the neighbors, you know, knowing that nobody's going to break in my house and no one's going to steal from me because they are getting educated and they're, you know, being taught things. And it's from a biblical perspective. Um, and so the churches have really joined in. And, you know, every time, you know, every year, this is the fourth year we've had Second Chance Month and the mayor does a proclamation. The House of Representatives does a proclamation. Uh, the Senate does a proclamation. And this year, I think the last couple of years, the governor did a state proclamation for Second Chance Month. And uh, a few of those will actually come to our office and read the proclamations at our office. And so it's been um, it's been great seeing how the community is responding to what we've uh, done over the years and what we'll continue to do. So I'm very thankful for the support of uh, Greenville City and County. Yeah, and as you describe, you're doing something that is protective of the community, which makes uh, members of the community want to be involved even more. You know, I want to be part of that. And so uh, let's just kind of wrap this up. Maybe you can talk about uh, how people volunteer, how they can, you know, come to Soteria and volunteer to do, you know, whatever you might need that they have the ability or the time to do. Most definitely. So one of the most important things I believe that people can come do who have the capacity is become a mentor to one of our interns. Our, our people come into our program directly from prison. Uh, they're referred usually by a chaplain, a social worker, or a caseworker. And when they get out, we have rules and regulations. They have classes that they do every night. So we have people that can teach the classes as well. Some of the life skill classes, uh, addiction recovery classes, financial literacy, Bible studies, um, and you know, that's during the night, you know, any time between six and eight. And then mentoring also is another uh, place where people can get involved. They can come and mentor one of our interns for up to a year. They can do six months or a year, uh, you know, which I think are the top two uh, things. Uh, also, when they get out, we get them a, what we call a first day kit. All of the hygiene and products and underwear and things like that that they need. We get churches and businesses and families that donate the, those items. And when they come on the first day, we have them a little packet together, the people that are getting out of prison so that they'll have clean underwear and sock and things like that, socks and uh, all the hygiene things. And so we also have dinners once a week. If people sign up, you, you can come and with your family or your business or church can bring a dinner and meet some of our residents in our transitional house, you know, just to come and see, you know, the, the people and from there, you may find another area of volunteerism, uh, you know, that you can get into. And also we have our office here. We have a lot of times people come and answer the phone and file papers and just do whatever we need to do around the office. And so that's a great way for people to get involved as well. Just some of the few things that, you know, we can do. Yeah, that's that's quite a list. And what some of the, some wonderful ways for our community members to not only get involved, but really learn to appreciate what's going on as a Terry and what you guys are um, doing. So we can be proud of it, you know, as a community. Yes. Um, that, that's awesome. And I definitely encourage everybody and we'll, we'll have your um, website posted um, down below with the replay on this video. So I invite everybody to definitely go check it out. This is a wonderful organization. And Jerry, thank you so much um, for coming on today. And, and talking about what you guys do. I'm sure we probably could have gone on for um, two hours. There's just so much, but this was a really great overview, I think, of um, kind of how Soteria came into existence, what you're doing for people, what you're doing for the community, and really how you're a model for, you know, other folks around the country. And um, I love what you do and how you came to do it. It's just a great story. So thank you for sharing that. Well, thank you for having me. I'm honored to spend some time with you and I'm thankful for all of the help that our community and staff and board members give to us too. So thank you for, the, for today. It's been really great talking with you. I appreciate it. And we also, of course, want to thank our audience for tuning in uh, today, either live or if you're on the replay. Um, you know, we're, we're glad to have everybody here with us. And, and if you found this helpful and valuable, which I'm sure you did, be sure and um, 
uh, share it out on YouTube to other people so that they can know about what Soteria is doing and how they can get involved or how they might may want to uh, start something like this in their community um, if they don't have it. We certainly want to get this important information out you know, to everybody that we can. So thanks again, Jerry, and our audience. And I want to uh, remind everybody that uh, next Tuesday at noon, we will have another episode of Level Up Law. And our attorney, Tiffany Love, is going to be talking about collateral consequences of criminal records, which we've gotten a good um, start on today. So definitely tune in next Tuesday at noon. You can register on our uh, website. Uh, or if you're following us on social media, you can click the link there. So again, Jerry, thanks. Uh, we appreciate it so much. And that concludes today's webinar. Thanks, everybody. Good day.